Are you prepared? I know you prepared your house. I know you prepared your income. I know you prepared your marriage, your children. You planned out your whole life. But you've made no plans whatsoever for where you're headed when you leave this world. Hell is a place. It is a place that existed before you were ever born. It is there. It's going to be there. And there's nothing you can do to change that one bit whatsoever. It doesn't make any difference if the churches today have stopped preaching on hell, if the preachers don't preach on hell, if the seminaries and Bible colleges don't teach the young men about hell, if they extricate it from the Bible, it makes no difference whatsoever. It is still a place that you must deal with one day. In Luke chapter 16, when the rich man died and was buried, and the Bible says in hell, he lifted up his eyes. It's, a, it's almost as if it says he awakened in a place that was absolutely beyond his wildest imagination. He never for one time thought that such a place like that could exist. He lifted up his eyes in hell. He became aware of his presence. He knew where he was. And from that moment on, there's not a thing he could do to change his circumstance and his situation. And when he had opened the fourth seal, and when he had opened the fourth I heard the seal, voice of the fourth, the beast, of the say, fourth beast say, Come and see. And, and, and I looked. looked. And behold, and behold a, pale a pale horse, horse. and his, his name, name that settled him, him was, death. was death, and hell, hell followed him. with him. He lifted up his eyes and hell, he became aware of his presence, he knew where he was. And from that moment on, there's not a thing he could do to change his circumstance and his situation. There is no salvation in hell. There's no Savior in hell. There's no Bible in hell. There's no blood in hell. There's no altars in hell. There's no forgiveness in hell. Whatever goes to hell stays in hell. It's permanent. It's settled. It's settled. It's over with. What you've done in this life is what determines where you go. When you die without God, you go to hell. Hell is a place, therefore, that awaits you at the end of your life. It's waiting. It's a place that, my friend, has plenty of patience. It doesn't matter if you live 150 years. It won't bother hell one bit. It's waiting. It has much patience. For it knows that every soul lost without God that departs from this world will enter into its mouth. People need to know that they are making their eternal destiny right now, today, at this moment. God is trying to tell us this is what the story of man is all about. Is the devil is coming to test us and tempt us and try to get us to curse God. God wants people to follow him by choice. He doesn't want robots. He wants us to choose to place our faith in Him, to choose to live in obedience to Him. And perhaps the devil gives that opportunity for us to make those very hard choices. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus talked about hell more than He talked about heaven. And I think implied in there is an urgency to warn people that unless you do something about it, you will be going to hell. It communicated a thought that the worst possible place, the most painful, a fire that never goes out, it's a terrible place. Although the Bible makes relatively few overt references to hell, its graphic nature is forever emblazoned in several passages. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 13, verse 42. Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 8 and 9. He knows he can never be restored to his former greatness. He knows he can never hurt God. 
But it's like a human being. If you've got a big, strong, beefy neighbor, you might not want to take him on, but when he's not looking, he might kick his dog. When he goes after human souls, he's doing it to try to get even with God. The apocalyptic story about the end of the world and final judgment. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them. They went down alive into the grave. The earth closed over them. Numbers chapter 16, verses 32 and 33. The devil both watches over hell and entices us to join him there. The quickest path to hell is doing Satan's bidding here on earth. The devil's presence and the devil's temptation give me a choice to do right or to do wrong. A choice to give in to the temptation or to resist it and be obedient to God's word. Lucifer, the light bearer, is one of God's most beautiful and beatific angels. But his hubris drives Lucifer to challenge God. And the Bible says that Lucifer decided in his heart he wanted to be like God. In fact, he wanted to be God and he wanted to ascend to the throne. Lucifer and his warrior angels engaged the army of God led by the Archangel Michael. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. There was a battle, there was a fight, there was an argument, there was a reckoning. And God said, you can't be up here anymore. I cannot use you as I'll use others. And banished him to earth, banished him to earth, banished him to earth. Stripes have long latched on to the devil's coattails to express disdain for conventional authority. Celebrating the devil is a startling way to oppose all that society holds sacred, a fact that some in rock and roll have exploited. What better way to define itself as being rebellious in a Christian society than to start glorifying hellacious imagery and having bands who took on the persona of demons and devils and who sort of laughed at the idea that, that hell is a bad place. Legal cases involving the devil were rarely seen in American courts. But suddenly, with the satanic ritual craze of the 1980s and 90s, he was back. Hundreds of parents and daycare workers in Britain and the United States were accused of abusing thousands of children in bizarre witches' sabbaths. If you read the first account in the Gospel of Mark of an exorcism, is when Jesus is in a synagogue, a demonized person, all of a sudden lifts up his voice and says, Aha! We know who you are, the Holy Son of God. Have you come to torture us before our time? And so this man is screaming, but it's not the man, it's the demon. And then Jesus tells the demon to shut up and come out, and the man is set free. We believe there are millions, perhaps even billions, of, of fallen angels that are working underneath Satan's control. So with so many of them, we do believe we have to be on guard. To deny hell is to deny God, he said it in the Bible, to deny Jesus, the one who I follow, uh, to deny scripture. Wide is the gate, and broad is the road, that leads to destruction, and many may enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road, that leads to life, and only a few will find it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. There is no salvation in hell. 
There's no Savior in hell. There's no Bible in hell. There's no blood in hell. There's no altars in hell. There's no forgiveness in hell. Whatever goes to hell stays in hell. It's permanent. It's settled. It's settled. It's over with. That's why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. That's why He died at the cross at Calvary. He didn't die to make you rich. He didn't die because of who you are. He didn't die to create this hell hole you know about. He died to keep you out of hell. That's why He went to the cross. That's why it's so horrible. That's why it took the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible said God made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's why Calvary was so horrendous. Because He would keep you out of hell. There's only one name on the face of this earth that can keep you out of hell. It's not Baptist. It's not Methodist. It's not Presbyterian. It's not Catholic. It's not Jew. There's just one name that can keep you out of hell and it's the name of Jesus Amen. folks use that name day in and day out they use the word hell day in and day out they become desensitized to it it has no meaning anymore it has no punch to it it doesn't grab the soul and the spirit and that my friend was born in hell itself Satan created that you become so familiar with the word that it's just part of the average language of, the, of people who walk to and fro on the street but hell has still existing nothing has stopped it it burns to the lowest hell that Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 29 our God is a consuming fire there's holiness about God if you could go into the presence of God unsaved he would literally annihilate you you'd rather be in hell in a heartbeat than to come before a holy God thrice holy 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 dare walk into the presence of God without the blood covering your soul you'd scream for hell you'd beg for hell you'd cry for hell and yet I firmly believe hell burns because of the holiness of God that's what hell is about. It's about a place that you go to without God. Somebody said hell is separation from God. Who told you that? Where's that in the Bible? Find it from Genesis to Revelation. Well, I heard the greatest evangelist say that. It didn't make any difference what he said. What does the Bible say? He'll be dead and gone and another generation will come on. Then another generation will come on. Then another generation will come on. What does the Bible say? We're judged by the book, my friend. Yep. Yep. What does the Bible say? Well, preacher, I want to tell you the truth. I've never read it. That's the truth. Most Christians haven't read it. They've never read it through from Genesis to Revelation. The sad state is that in the church today, most people are as ignorant of the Bible as they can be. That's why they can be tossed from one church to the next church, one doctrine to the next doctrine. It's because we are such a flim flam bunch, because we don't know anything about God or His Word. It's a sad commentary, but the Bible. Bible has not changed. Hell is real. I'm not going there. Amen. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter number 5, Hell fire. Oh, if I thought for a moment I was going to hell. I don't think I could sleep, to sleep tonight. If I thought for a moment that I may, I may die. I, my, my, my body may cease today. My heart may beat its last. This may be my last day on planet earth. It may be your last day on planet earth. You may be totally, completely, physically healthy right now, but something takes your life away. You could die before the sun goes down. Your body be lying dead in the morgue down here somewhere. And they'll be having your funeral a couple of days from now. Where will you be? Where will you be? Where will you be? Well, preacher, I just don't believe all that. Oh, you don't, do you? Well, what do you base it on, dear friend? What do you base the fact that you don't believe in hell? What do you base it, what do you base it on? Well, I just don't believe God's like that. What do you know about God? What God are you talking about? You ever bothered to read His Word? You ever bothered to read the Word of the God that you say you know about? What did He say in His Word? He said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. He brought a flood upon this earth one time. Thousands of years ago, the layers upon planet earth proved that flood was universal. From one end of the globe to the other, water covered this earth. Water was all over the planet. You find it everywhere if you want to look. It's there. 
He destroyed it one time with water, never to do it again, but next time he's coming with fire. The Lord Jesus Christ said the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. Where's that at in the Bible? It's in the Bible, friend. Read the Bible, you'll find out that God's not too happy with what's going on around us. We live in a generation that's literally brainwashed. I've never seen anything like it in my life. This generation will embrace anything. They'll believe anything, embrace anything. This is the most relativistic bunch that ever lived on the face of the earth. And they mar I marvel at how they're in your face with it. In your face constantly. And it's gotten to the point where everybody's desensitized. Nobody's convicted of anything anymore. Murderers day in and day out. Murderers in this town right now would blow your brains out for enough bunny for fix it crack cocaine. It's never crossed their murdering mind that they're going to burn in hell. They never thought the fact that they're going to burn one day in hell. We've gotten to the point now where it's just simply passe. It doesn't matter anymore. There's no meaning to anything. Whatever you feel good about doing, do it. Here's the situation. I see it today and I know how my goodness Satan is so smart. Satan has brainwashed a whole nation. He's brainwashed them to the point to where sin's no longer sin. Death is no longer death. Human life is, has no value. And boy, do they walk to the streets today. We've got them locked up in our jails right now, perpetrating some of the worst crimes in history of this nation. Right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And the families have been going through hell now, and we'll be going through hell. They keep postponing the dates of the trials time and time again. Some of the worst murdering that ever happened. If those men had thought that one day they're going to die and drop off into hell and burn forever, it might have caused them to take note. And without Jesus Christ, they will drop off into hell and they will burn forever. Hell is full of murderers. One man was just recently sentenced to 40 years in, in Knoxville, Tennessee, 40 years for raping four women on Chapman Highway at Knife Point. Raping them, and he's just 26 or 27 years old himself. There's no fear among anybody today to take a woman and rape her. Put her at knife, put her, just rape her. He'll go to hell without Jesus Christ. You didn't hear about that in the news. You don't read in the papers because they don't scare you to death. You live in an insane society. For there is no fear of God in their eyes. Nobody fears God anymore. Hell is not full. Hell is full of multi-millionaires and multi-billionaires. There are old men in this world in their 80s and their 90s that are so rich they could buy and sell Knoxville, Tennessee. My friend, they're going to die and go to hell. There are politicians running this world right now that one day they'll step down from the kings and the queens and the presidents and the parliamentarians and they'll go to hell one day. Hell is full of kings. Hell is full of queens. Some of the biggest and greatest that's ever lived among men are in hell right now. Hell knows no identity. It is no respecter of persons. The young and the old go to hell. The rich and the poor go to hell. The black and the white and the red and the yellow go to hell. Hell knows no distinctions. Baptists go to hell. Methodists go to hell. Presbyterians go to hell. Catholics go to hell. Episcopalians go to hell. Russians go to hell, Jews go to hell, Americans go to hell, Englishmen go to hell, Portuguese go to hell, Africans go to hell. Without Jesus Christ, there is no way out of hell. There is hell, preacher. Hell is a place at the end of your life. That's where it is. That's at the end of your life. I was dumb with silence, I held my peace, even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me, while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is that I may know how frail I am. 
Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Surely every man walketh in a vain show, surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind, mine eye shall no more see good. The eye of him that hath seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing, because our days upon earth are a shadow. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, in the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. For thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And here's the saddest thing about hell. When you get there, it's too late. Nothing can be done for you. You're going to hell, and when you die, it's too late. The rich man said, let me go back. Let me go back and warn my brethren. Oh, Abraham, let me go. This place of torment. I've got to warn them. He said, they've got Moses and the prophets. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, they hear not one that comes back from the dead. He said, oh, Abraham, would you just please take a Lazarus and just send him here with a drop on his finger to drop it in my tongue. Lest I be torn. Oh, just a little drop. Oh, Lazarus! Just a drop! Ah, tormented in these flames. Hell is at the end of a Christ-rejecting life. How do I stay out of hell, preacher? See, that's the good thing. I don't want to go to hell, preacher. That's good. Thought of it, uh, that worries me, preacher. I don't want to go to hell. That's good. It's good. That's real good. How can I not go to hell, preacher? One name. One name given among men whereby we must be saved. Only one name. Only one name. That's the name of Jesus. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. What does it mean to have him preach? That means you've embraced him. You believe on him. He's in you. He's your Savior. Is he? Let me give you a little bit of stuff right here. 
that you need to hear. How many of you have heard about the hole that they dug over there in Russia, down into the ground? And they were digging this hole that's uh, deep, deep, deep down into the earth. And when they, they had this microphone, and they, they lowered this microphone down into this hole. And these men lowered it down in there because they, they, they wanted to hear the, the moving of, the, of the, the, the rocks and the shale and, you know, some kind of a scientific survey. So they were lowering the microphone down to hear this, these seismologists and, 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 uh, and, and what are these, you know, the men that deal with this stuff. And they dropped it down in there, but what they heard was not what they wanted to hear. And they pulled that thing back up out of there because they heard screaming. They heard human screaming. They heard screaming. They heard screaming in hell. Now I've got a clean copy of it now, and uh, I warn you, uh, this could scare you. Here's the email. Dear Art Bell, I just recently began listening to your radio show and could not believe it when you talked about the sounds from hell tonight. My uncle had told me this story a couple of years ago, and I didn't believe him. Like one of your listeners who discounted the story as nothing more than just a religious newspaper fabricated account. The story about the digging of the hole and the hearing of the sounds from hell is very real. It did occur in Siberia. My uncle collected videos and audio tapes and so forth on the paranormal, supernatural. He passed away fairly recently, but he would have loved your show. He let me listen to one of the audio tapes that he had on the sounds from hell in Siberia, and I copied it. He received his copy from a friend who worked at the BBC. It took me a while to find it tonight, but attached is that sound from my uncle's tapes. It's not the greatest quality, but the sounds are there. I was very hesitant to send you this as the sound bothers me to listen to. I'd suggest that if you do play it on the program, warn listeners in advance so they may have the option of turning the radio off for 30 seconds while it plays. It has always haunted me. To those who discounted the Siberia sounds from Hell Story, it is true, and I for one wish it wasn't. Rick, listening from Chicago. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit, with the people of old time, and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in places desolate of old, with them that go down to the pit, that thou be not inhabited, and I shall set glory in the land of the living, I will make thee a terror, and thou shalt be no more. Though thou be sought for, yet shalt thou never be found again. The fellow who was in charge of this name is Dr. Azakov. Dr. Azakov, he's an atheist. He's a Russian communist atheist. Didn't believe in God. Didn't believe in heaven. Didn't believe in any eternity. Died like a dog. Take your last breath, it's over. But he said, I believe in hell now. 
Now you say, well, I've seen that story on the internet and I don't believe it's true. Well, you know something? I've done a lot of research into that right there. We've got the tape of the screams in hell. We've got the sound of it. Did you know that some scientific work has been done on those tapes? And they have said, if somebody did make this up, they did a good job because of the way the sounds blend and the screaming blends all on that tape yeah. in hell, screaming in hell. Now you say, when well, I preach, I don't believe any of that. I don't believe any of it. Do you know why you don't believe? You don't believe because the God of this world has blinded your minds to the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you don't believe. You don't believe based on scientific evidence. Oh, no, 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 no. And you certainly don't believe based on your own personal experience. You don't believe because you don't want to believe. Your scapegoat is rationalism, the natural mind, and denial. I don't live in denial. You do. But I beg you, in the name of Jesus. That's what all these people are shouting about in here this morning. Jesus died and was buried and rose again the third day so that you could be saved. He loves you. He died for you. He shed his precious blood for you to be saved. You don't have to come down to the hour of death, terrorized, full of fear, not knowing where you're going. You can come down to that moment. If we do, we may not because the Lord may come back before that. But you can come down to that end of this physical life with full assurance and joy and say it as Paul did. I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. Or you can say it as Peter did. The Lord hath showed me how that I must shortly put off this my tabernacle. Pull it off. And lay it down with full victory and assurance. Why don't you do that? I beg you in the name of Jesus. I may be talking to somebody right here this morning. We'll be having your funeral this week. I beg you in the name of Jesus. There's just one Savior. There's only one name. And his name is Jesus. Would you accept him? Luke chapter number 12 and verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Have you noticed the wording? That's very important. To die doesn't put you in hell. Note carefully that death and hell are separate. They're two separate things. You can't, no man has the power to put you in hell. No being has the power to put you in hell. But he does. He says, and I forewarn you whom ye shall fear that my friend fear him that after you hath died hath power to put you in hell that's what the Lord Jesus just said he said yea I forewarn you now my friend take that warning would you please would you please hear what the son of God has to say if you shut your eyes in death in this world that's one thing but the Bible says that he has power he has authority he has the ability to cast you into hell fire. I don't want to go there. I want you to understand something. You hear me well. I don't want to go there. There's no mitigating circumstances. No courts of appeal. No judges. No judgment. Once you are cast into hell fire, you're in the very presence of the Almighty being judged by Him. There is no higher court. There is no appellate, for, appellate court from that place. You're there. And there you'll remain. Are you sure? Are you absolutely certain? Do you know without a shadow a doubt if your heart stops beating in the next 30 minutes and your body dies where you are going to go for the Bible said I forewarn you whom ye shall fear fear him once you're dead that hath power to cast you into hell that's a fearful thing that's the kind of warning that somebody ought to take and here's how he finishes it he said yea I say unto you fear him now my friend if you have if you have any sense at all about you to understand that you're here and you're going somewhere you ought to take heartily in your heart that warning he warned you the public school system didn't warn you the government didn't warn you my friend the secular society that you live in didn't warn you they don't know what they're 
talking about. You understand? They do not know what they're talking about. But this book I have in my hand is the Word of God. And he said, I warn you. Yay! He said, I warn you. Listen to the voice of the Son of God. He said, I warn you. The one that went to the cross and bore your sin in his body. The one whose back they laid open with a cat of nine tails. The one they nailed the nails in his hands and in his feet. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He said, I forewarn you. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of death and hell. I forewarn you. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He said, I forewarn you. And the throne of God and of the Lamb become one throne. He said, I warn you. There is none greater. In Revelation 1 verse 18, He is called the Almighty. He is God Almighty manifested in flesh. There is none greater. He's God if there is God. And there is no greater God than the one that said, I forewarn you. Where you going dear friend? You've had a warning. In Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 11, in the latter part of humanity's existence, as it comes down to the end, as it all winds up, he says this in Revelation 20 and verse number 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Could it be that the Almighty had veiled his might, he had veiled his visage, he had veiled his glory, he had veiled his personage when he spoke this world into existence and said let there be yes sirree this bible said I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the scripture said wherein dwelleth righteousness and the bible says when this great white throne when he sits upon the throne and his visage is, un, is, is opened up for creation to see when they begin to look upon the face of the almighty they can't take it they've got to move they can't stand Stand before him. Nothing can stand before him. He is so holy. His light is so pure. His love is so fi refined. He is who he is. And nothing can stand before the God that I serve. Except he be purged. He's got to be cleansed. He's got to be changed. He's got to be saved. He made a son of God out of him. So you can stand before him one day. And you can worship him. And take in his glory. Boy, you talk about soaking up something. When you take in the glory of that glorious being that is from everlasting to everlasting and creation can't even stand it. Imagine what he's raised it to. So the Bible said this white throne, they marched before it. Who are you? Will you be there? Will you be at the white throne judgment? Will you be at the place, my friend, where they mock God? They make fun of him. They laugh in his face. They, my friend, do anything they please. They wallow in their iniquity. And they think that they're going to be able to live like that and just die and it's all over with. No, I'm sorry. You're sadly mistaken. As the bumper sticker said, you better hope there's no God because of the way you're living. My friend, I'm going to tell you something right now. You'd better hope there is no God if you're living like hell itself. But I'm going to tell you this morning, there is. There is. There he is. It is not certain that you'll retire, but it is certain that you'll die. It is absolutely, completely certain that the day is going to come when your life is going to end on this earth. Have you made preparation? Have you made preparation? Have you prepared yourself for that day? For it is coming. It is coming. And there's not one thing you can do to stop it. That day is coming. Are you ready? You say, well now, preacher, I just don't want to think about it. Not thinking about it is not going to change anything. Denying it is not going to change it. Saying it's not going to happen except for some long time off into the future. That's not so. Teenagers die. Young people die. Kids die. People die in their midlife. They die at all ages. Death is no respecter of age. And that's one that's absolutely certain that you're going to die. The Bible said it's appointed to men once to die. And then the judgment. Notice how the Bible concludes or continues on with the fact that even though that life leaves the body, 
it's not over. It's really just the beginning. It's just the beginning. So the Bible said it's appointed to men once to die. I ask you again. I'm going to ask you a pointed, simple question. Have you made provision? Are you ready? If you're not ready to die, you're not ready to live. You don't know anything about life until you realize where you're headed when the life leaves this body. Are you ready to die? It's here. It's a fact. It's something we deal with. And so my friend this morning, one more time, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you made provision? for death are you ready i'm not talking about your funeral i'm not talking about if you bought you a plot and ground out here i'm not talking about how much money you've got laid up and then you've told people what you want them to say who's going to sing at your funeral and where they're going to do it and this and that that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about the moment that your soul and spirit leaves this body and you breathe no more and you have no control over it and you leave planet earth and you are going to leave this world are you ready for that day if you've ever been up to the door of death and felt its wing it felt its cold icy chill on your soul then you're different from most people some people on this earth have been there they've seen it they understand what it's about they know how it feels and it changes them for the rest of their lives take note of that you ought to watch somebody that's been there. You ought, to, you ought to listen to them. You ought to listen to what they've got to say because they have something to say that you need to hear. In recent decades, numerous people have reported near-death experiences. A conscious perceptual experience which takes place during a near-death encounter. Most describe a peaceful journey, being guided through a tunnel bathed in bright light. But a select few have experienced something far more frightening. They claim they have journeyed into a world alive with torment. They believe they have been to hell and back. Anything that you've ever imagined or seen in a horror movie, um, it was worse than that. In 1985, 38-year-old Howard Storm was traveling in Europe when he suddenly collapsed with a perforated stomach. Rushed to the hospital, his condition quickly worsened. And the doctors told me that my life expectancy was about five hours. That night, Howard lost consciousness. As he slipped toward death, Storm believes he left his body. Mysterious voices called out to him, and he followed them into the hallway. There were a number of these people, uh, male and female, all adults, and um, very difficult to see them. They immediately encircled me. They were getting closer, and it was getting tighter as we went into this increasing darkness and I'm like I'm just completely terrified so they began to push and pull at me they were definitely uh, trying to elicit pain what they were doing at first was um, scratching and biting and then it got much worse and I had their mouths in me and on me I was screaming, I was fighting. Although not a religious man, Storm says he called out prayers he had learned as a child in Sunday school. And the people who were around me couldn't bear the mention of God. And they became um, extremely violent and agitated. So I yelled out with everything that I had, Jesus, please save me. And he came to me and touched me and lifted me up and made me whole and filled me with his love and embraced me. Within minutes, Howard Storm was revived. And after surgery, he recovered. But his life was forever changed by what he believes he saw. This was like the portal of hell or the entrance to hell. People need to know that they are making their eternal destiny right now, today, at this moment. I want to notice the second thing in Luke chapter number 16, verse number 23 about death. You're going somewhere. 
Luke chapter number 16, verse number 23. The Bible said in verse number 22, and it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice the way the Bible says this now. It's clear. It delineates the difference between the death of the body and the existence of the soul. The Bible said in verse number 22, and was buried. There's the body. Verse 23, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Notice how the Bible says it. In hell, he lift up his eyes. That's quite a thing. That's a descriptive term. That's the kind of thing that you ought to look at and think and take into your heart. He died. I don't know if he got sick and died. I don't know if he was struck down. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he's killed in an accident, but the Bible said the rich man died. It is inevitable. It's coming. He died. And they buried him. But they didn't bury him. They buried his body. For he's still around in the next verse. Notice how clear the scripture is in it. Even though they buried his body, the scripture says that in hell, he lift up his eyes. He lift up his eyes. He took in where he was. It's the idea that after he body, his, his soul and spirit leaves his body, that he looks where he is. He looks around. He takes it in. And my, what a shock it must have been. My, what horror must have fled his soul. My, can you imagine how he must have felt? He might have been an atheist. He might have been an agnostic. He might have thought he was good. He might have been a self-righteous, religious person, regardless of what he was. The time came when he lift up his eyes. Do you understand the horror that's going to flood your soul? The moment you wake up in hell, when you realize that there's nothing around you but damnation and sorrow and burning in hell. Can you imagine what that'll be like? There's nobody to plead with. There's nobody to cry out to. There's nobody to go to to get help. You're in hell. To lift up your eyes in hell has got to be the worst shock that could possibly happen to anybody. Not dying. You're going to die. You'll prepare yourself, some of you, for that. You know you're going to leave here. That's not a shock. The shock is waking up where you don't expect to be. To think that when you die, you die like a dog and it's all over with. You bragged, you boasted, you've told people about how it. This is it. I'm just a dog. I'm just, a, I'm just an animal. And when my life is gone, just take me and bury me somewhere. It's all over with. I'm going to live life. This is it. One day at a time. And to find out how wrong you were. But it's too late to realize that after all of your bragging, it's too late. That you are in a place that you can't do anything about. You don't have any idea of the horror that'll flood your soul. That's what happened to this man. The Bible said he lift up his eyes in hell. My goodness gracious, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I don't want to go to hell. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to hell. And I'm not basing my future on you. The finest man that I ever knew in my life, the greatest Christian that I've ever met, I would not trust for one second with my soul. There's just one that I trust. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. I put my hope in Him, my future in Him, my faith in Him. What I am is in Him because He arose from the dead, glory to God. Our future is in Christ. It's all about the Son of God. Amen. It's not about a man. It's not about somebody's church. It's not about somebody's religion, system of ethics, whatever. It's in a man. Amen. And I've looked across the bar. I've been at a point in my life where I thought I might die. What'd you do, preacher? Did you think about your religion? I didn't give it five seconds. Amen. What about the people that you didn't even bother? What about this? I, none of it. Just the name of Jesus. I grabbed it. I latched on to the name of Jesus. That's the only comfort there is of this world. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you really take hold of him and he becomes a comfort to you, that reminds you and reassures you in your soul that you're a real believer. Yes! 
Did you hear what I said? When you're down and flat and it's out and you're out at the count, it's the one you're calling out to and take hold of and get comfort from. That's the one you believe in. Amen. Amen. Some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Your comfort is in a prayer you prayed. Your comfort is in a catechism that you were uh, approved by. Your comfort is in your church. And there is no comfort in that hour but in one man. Christ Jesus the Lord. Atheist, if you wake up in eternity and there's a God Almighty out there and you know you're approaching Him, you're not going to bother asking anything. Here's what the Bible says about it. In Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 31, it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's what it says. Your issue's not with preacher Lawson. You pick me to death. You tear me up. I'm just a man. I'm a mortal being. If you could make it between you and me, why you got, you got, you won already. You've already won. It's not about you and me. It's about you and this. It was here before you ever showed up. It'll be here when you're long gone. It was here before your school was ever built. It'll be here when your school is falling in ruins. This is the eternal word of the living God. The issue is not Preacher Lawson. The issue is God's word. Here's a man who's the son of a Methodist preacher. He was a good man, a good moral man, benevolent man. But he had one horrible fault. His heart was full of bitterness, and cursing. On several occasions, he went under deep conviction for salvation during revival meetings. Conviction is when you begin to quake because you hear the word of God, not here, but down here. God opens you up. That bothers sinners. When God opens you up, you know it's God because there's stuff he opens up to you that nobody knows about. Did you hear me? You can cover up your sin to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your friends. But buddy, when you go into a service and something opens you up, and I mean opens you up and says, I know everything about everything, and starts naming it, dates, times, places, that's conviction. Because he points you to Christ. He went through conviction, turned it off. A year later, another camp meeting held the same place, brought again under conviction, refused to yield. Listen to this. And three days later, he died suddenly. It's like J. Harold Smith when he preaches God's three deadlines. This man sinned away his day of grace. He was dead in three days. And by the way, they don't come any better than J. Harold Smith. God's three deadlines. Listen to this now if you don't hear anything else. I was with him in his last moments. He said, he seemed to be utterly forsaken of the Lord from the beginning of his sickness. The most powerful medicines had no effect on him whatsoever. Just as the sun of a beautiful Sabbath morning rose in its splendor over the eastern hills, he died in horrible agony. Listen, all through the night previous to his death, he suffered untold physical and mental torture. He offered to physicians all his earthly possessions if they would save his life. He was stubborn till the very last, would not acknowledge his fear of death till a few moments before he died. Then suddenly he began to look, then to stare, horribly surprised and frightened into the vacancy before him. Then exclaimed as he beheld the king of terrors in all of his merciless wrath, my God! My God! Here is this unbeliever, Christ rejecter, who would say, I'll give you anything I got, Doc, if you'll, say, if you'll just give me a little more life. He's looking off into eternity, and he says, My God! His eyes bulged out of his head, popped out of its socket almost. And here's what they said. The indescribable expression of his countenance at this juncture, together with the despairing tones in which he uttered these last words, made every heart quake. 
His wife screamed and begged the brother to pray for him. But he was so terror stricken he rushed out of the room. The dying man continued to stare in dreadful astonishment, his mouth wide open, his eyes protruding out of their sockets till the last. And he fell over dead. Do you want to die like that? You say, people, the preacher, you're, you're an alarmist. You're playing on our emotions. You're just, you know, you, 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 you're trying to hype this thing to get me emotionally involved. No, I'm trying to reach you. You're jaded. What's that mean, preacher? You've seen so many deaths, seen so much violence on television, heard so much with your ears, that it's the point now where it takes a, a sledgehammer to reach inside and get by all of that and get down to where you live and talk to you. And don't worry about this soul over here. Pray for him. In a few minutes, you may be down there next to them. I prayed before I got up here this morning, Holy Ghost, I'm the messenger, Lord, but this is your service. Some of these people may hear what they're hearing for the last time on this earth. This may be their last opportunity to ever make it right with God. And so he died. My God, he cried. The God that he wouldn't believe in, the God he wouldn't trust, the God he didn't believe was there. My God, he said. And his doctor couldn't help him, his wife couldn't help him, his friends couldn't help him, nobody in the room could help him, nobody could do a thing. And he died, he died. And he lift up his eyes. Now folks, listen to me. Your friends can go eat with you, your friends can go play with you, your family can gather around the table, you can talk, converse, socialize, do all you want to, everybody have all the friends, this, that, and so forth and so on. But when it comes to the time of crossing over from this world into eternity, you're going to do it alone. You're going to do it alone. Are you ready for that? Let's talk about something else. It's called the cross. Jesus Christ, now listen carefully, did not die a horrible death on the cross for you to drive a new car. These godless prosperity preachers that spend all their time, all their time, godless as they can be, hear me and hear me well. There's only so much time left in this life, and you hear me well. All they talk about is money, 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 money. And they don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the cross, and salvation, and redemption, and the new birth. They know nothing about it. Where are they going, preacher? They're going to hell. They're going to hell, and they'll drag you down with them. I don't care if they're Pentecostal, Baptist, Lutheran, Episcopal. I don't care what they are. If all that preacher that you listen to talks about is money, what did Christ die for? They had money before he ever died. Long before he died. What did he die for then, preacher? He suffered the horror of the cross to keep you out of the horror of hell. The cross was horrible, horrible, horrible suffering. Unbelievable suffering. The reason it's so horrible is because hell is horrible. He, he died, died to, to keep, keep you out of hell. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? For God, God, God. God. God so loved so God so loved so the world. Gave his own son. He's a man. 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 What have you got to say for yourself now?
behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and of death. Horrible suffering! Unbelievable suffering! The reason it's so horrible is because hell is horrible. And the sacrifice of the Son of God was to keep you out of hell. I don't want to go to hell, preacher. I don't want to go. Well, I don't either. If you tell me this morning that you don't want to go to hell, you're showing me that you're still in your right mind. That you haven't been brainwashed and duped to the point now where you bought into this lie where everybody's good and everybody's the same and everybody's going to go to heaven. No, they're not. No, they're not. Well, how do I stay out of hell, preacher? There's only one that can keep you out of hell. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's what Peter said. But the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you cry out to him today? Why don't you accept him now? Why don't you say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. Save me. The motive might not be all that pure, but who you're coming to is pure. Think about that. Don't ever let some religionist hang something over your head and tell you and try to analyze you and break you down spiritually as to why you prayed and this and that. Just remember this. If any man comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ today. You come to him this morning. You get up out of that seat and you say, I don't want to lift up my eyes in hell. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to come down to the end of my life and look off into a dark eternity and not have a clue what lies on the other side. And the closer I get to it, the greater the terror grows. And then when the moment of light, when the moment comes where I cross over, there's something over there waiting on me. Go ask these atheists what's on the other side. Yeah. I'll tell you something else to ask them. Ask them what life is. They don't have a clue. Yet they're so arrogant and so proud. And they know it all. And we're so stupid to believe in a creator. Yet they could not tell you what life means. They don't know what it is. Tell me what it is. What is life? Define it for me. Well, it's breathing. There's no, you're just talking about the life of the body. What's the life in the body when the life leaves? What is that? Define that for me. I can tell you what the Bible says. As the body without the spirit is dead. It is the spirit of life that comes from the life giver that's breathed into the body of an of a, of a, of a organic thing and it comes to life. But there's a greater life than that. It is the very essence of God himself when he begets you as a son at the new birth. That cannot be taken away from you. That will never leave you. Once you've been born of the spirit, a million years from now, you'll still be born of the Spirit. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Oh, don't lift up your eye in hell. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And it's not about me. Not, don't do it for me. Do it for yourself. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Because if you do, it's too late. It's too late. Say, come and see. And, and I looked, look, and behold, behold, a pale horse. His name that sat on him was death. Was death. And hell followed with him.